stories of horror, greed, and murder. Mythologies of creatures, cultures from the deepest bayous and the thickest of woods, rumors of ghosts and witches. These are the tales and legends of the Deep South, weaved together through the tapestry of time, out of the dreams of those long past. This is Waking Ribbons. Welcome to the tale of Abigail. The album Abigail by King Diamond was released in 1987. It is part one of two. This album is the most beloved of King's, and with good reason. The story is a masterpiece. Of course, in true King Diamond fashion, it is filled with love, loss, and supernatural themes. So please, join me as we gather for the funeral of Abigail Le Fay. We are gathered here tonight to lay to rest Abigail Le Fay, whom we now know was first born dead on the seventh day of July, 1777. Abigail must be nailed to her coffin with seven silver spikes, one through each arm, hand, and knee, and let the last of the seven be drawn through her mouth so that she may never rise and cause evil again. Who will be the first? I, O'Brien, of the Black Horseman. July, 1845. Rain fell from the black sky in large beads on the roof of the coach. Lightning flashed in the distant sky and rumbled toward them as they bounced down the misty road up the hill. Jonathan Le Fay, who was 27, and Miriam Nadius, who was just 18, held hands tightly, looking out of the window toward their new home on the hill. Jonathan looked on his inheritance, the mansion, covered in darkness as if that was where the light came to die. He felt a tap on his shoulder that pulled him from his thoughts. Miriam pointed toward the empty field outside of her window. Not too far from the road, just outside of the derelict gates that surrounded the mansion, were seven men on horseback. Jonathan ordered the coachman to stop, which the driver slowed the carriage and halted just outside of the gates. Some shrouded in thick robes, and some looking with shining eyes at the coach. The figures all sat stoic atop their horses in the summer rain. Neither Jonathan nor Miriam spoke to them, as if in a trance looking at the men as if they had materialized before them through the dark. And as if the darkness itself had a voice, the men began to speak in unison. We know you've come to inherit what's yours, the mansion. Take our advice and go back on this night. If you refuse, eighteen will become nine. Puzzled, Jonathan and Miriam looked at each other. Miriam looked very concerned, but Jonathan smiled and chuckled. He shook his head. Get out of my way, he said to the men, with a brief wave of his hand. I don't believe a word you say. Driver, move on. With that, a crack sounded out from the front of the coach. The seven horsemen then began to move in unison back into the night and into the dark. Jonathan barely heard them as they called after the carriage as it moved. Someday you'll need our help, my friend. Miriam looked in fear at Jonathan, who pet her hand and said, Do not worry, my love. We are finally home. But Miriam was not at ease at all as the coach pulled into an empty driveway with no lights. It was darker than the night through which the carriage had just passed. Jonathan helped his bride out of the carriage as the coachman carelessly threw their bags and trunks from the back of the coach onto the stones under the carriageway. Jonathan turned to him angrily and said, "'What do you think you're doing? Those are our things!' "'I know, sir,' said the coachman. "'I'm not staying here a moment longer than I have to.' He pulled the last trunk from the carriage and jogged to the front of the coach. He climbed up to his seat, saying, "'We passed an inn in town before. I'm going there. You two are insane for staying here.' With that, he cracked the whip, and the horses took off the back the way they came. Miriam clung to Jonathan as they watched him leave through the rusty gates that, now that Jonathan really looked at them, seemed to have shadows swirling all around the rusted metal. 
as if they were alive. And as the gate closed behind the coach, the shadows closed back together as if healing a wound. Jonathan shook his head and then kissed Miriam's frightened lips and led her toward the front doors of the house. As he reached for the handle, he thought about the warning from the horseman. Eighteen will become nine. Eighteen is actually nine. It stuck in his mind. The giant front door moaned in protest as he pushed mightily to open it. The absence of light in the dusty room made it seem like the light from the outside spilled through the door like a spotlight. Jonathan reached into his pocket for his matches. He struck one on the bottom of his heel and found a candle in a holder on the wall. With Miriam on his heels, he went to it and grabbed the candle. With the candle lit, they went hand in hand to each room, lighting candles and fireplaces as they went. When they finished, Jonathan noticed something odd about the house. The house seemed to be breathing, as if they put life back into it with light. He looked at their surroundings in the bedroom where they finished exploring the house. Dust covered the furniture and the floor. They went to the bed and uncovered the bedclothes from it, shaking the dust from them. By then, the candlelight was fading. Jonathan looked at Miriam, who was looking out of the window, still shivering a bit. Let's go to bed, my love, he said to her. She turned back to him and nodded. The room had warmed enough for them to climb into the giant bed beneath the gilded canopy. They made love in their new home as the fireplace ceased to burn. And as the shadows began to come alive on the walls, the couple fell asleep in the silence. Sunrise came, and the day was filled with the two of them discovering the many rooms of their new home. Miriam dusted everywhere they went, Jonathan picked up debris from the scavenging of the rats and other rodents who would make their homes wherever they could in such a large house. Together, they unpacked all of their belongings. In the garden, Miriam found vegetables suitable for a stew. Jonathan caught a rabbit in the field beyond the house. They ate their dinner, enjoying the company of each other, swapping stories of their childhoods, finding that they had much in common. They laughed and fell in love ever more deeply that first day in their new home as the Lafays. As night came, they cleaned up their dinner and went to bed. They made love again and fell into a deep sleep of happiness and contentment. Jonathan awoke with a start. The room was ice cold, though the fire still burned in the fireplace. He looked to his wife, who was sleeping soundly, even smiling. Suddenly, a blinding white light appeared on his side of the large bed. Jonathan held his hand over his eyes as he tried to look. The light faded a bit, and there before him stood a spirit. The stories his uncle told him about the family ghost were all true. He has risen again. Don't be scared now, my friend, the ghost said, as he held up a ghostly hand toward a now trembling Jonathan. I am Count de la Fay, he said. Jonathan could not believe his eyes. I am dreaming, he said aloud. I am dreaming this all. You cannot be real. The ghost moved its head back and forth to let Jonathan know this was not a dream. The spirit then motioned for Jonathan to come and follow. With that, the spirit disappeared into the dark. Jonathan looked frantically all around the room for him. The cold remained as he searched. Just as suddenly, the spirit reformed at the door of the bedroom, motioning for Jonathan to come. Let me take you to the crypt, down below, where Abigail rests, said the Count. Who? said Jonathan. Who was Abigail? The spirit then quickly disappeared and reappeared right next to Miriam's sleeping body. Let Miriam sleep, said the Count, as he reached to caress Miriam's face. She would never understand. Reflexively, Jonathan was out of the bed, jumping toward the spirit to keep him away from Miriam. The spirit disappeared as Jonathan hit the floor where it stood. After he made such a loud thud, Jonathan looked back to see if he had awakened his wife. She stirred slightly, but did not wake. Jonathan stood up, grabbed his robe from the stand in the corner, and slipped on his house shoes. He heard a voice down the hall from the bedroom. Now come, let us go. Jonathan took a candlestick with him and his hunting knife as he made his way down the hall. A mist swirled before him in the hallway, but he pressed forward. He needed to find the intruder in his home. This being is playing a trick on him. 
This is merely a man who broke into his mansion and wants to do God's know what to him and his wife. Jonathan lit a lantern on his way with the candlestick. Then he followed the voice downstairs toward the cellar, into the crypt. It's time to know. As he started to step onto the stairs of the crypt, the Count reappeared before him on the steps. Beware of the slippery stairs, he said. You could easily fall and break your neck. Jonathan jumped back a bit and glared at the figure in anger. It had dimmed to a slight glow before him, but it seemed solid enough. Jonathan started to reach forward to see if he could feel a solid form in front of him. Before his hand reached its shoulder, the figure reached out. Hand me that torch, he said in a whisper, and I will lead the way to the secret in the dark. Without a word, Jonathan held out the lantern to the figure who somehow touched his hand but did not touch as he felt no solid fingers to which he could transfer the lantern. And still, it took the thing with no effort at all. Jonathan did not have a moment to wonder at the experience as the figure began to move quickly down the stairs. Jonathan followed as closely as he could, or dared. The crypt was dark and humid. The two figures passed solemnly through the opening of the family vault. Bones lay rotting in tattered and crumbling wooden caskets from generations long past. Suddenly, the Count stopped before an ornate box covered in thick layers of dust and grime. He pointed sharply with a look mixed of fear and reverence. Jonathan stepped forward as Count Lefay said, Take a look into the vault, the sarcophagus of a child. Jonathan looked deeper into the vault. He stepped closer to the sarcophagus. Abigail has been in here for years and years, said the Count, stillborn. Jonathan looked back at him. The Count's figure was now fully dark, just like Jonathan's. He looked solid. His face was dark and serious. Jonathan looked back at the coffin of the child and stepped again forward. Slowly, he was able to see the rotten corpse covered in dust, a dry and decayed body of an infant, wrapped in tattered cloth. The smooth black skin had no hair on it. The tiny eye sockets stared silently at the wet ceiling. Jonathan stared horrified as he saw large silver spikes sticking out of the infant's mouth pinning it to the bottom of the coffin. He looked down at her arms and legs, which were also pinned with large spikes to the coffin. His eyes filled with tears as he contemplated the evil that did this to an infant. He turned his face away as the horror was too much. He began to weep for the tiny baby. Suddenly, the Count found his face while it was turned away. The spirit of Abigail is inside your wife. He croaked into Jonathan's face. Jonathan jumped back against the dusty wall. The Count continued, And there's only one way you can stop the rebirth of evil itself. Jonathan pressed himself closer to the wall as the Count's visage came so close that he could smell the stale air coming from his non-existent mouth. You must take her life, said the Count. Now! Jonathan violently shook his head. No, shouted Jonathan. The Count shouted into Jonathan's face. You must, you must. No, Jonathan shouted, and he ran as fast as he could from the crypt. And as he tried to climb the wet stairs, as the Count had warned, he slipped and tumbled back down the stairs. Jonathan hit his head on the stone and fell into unconscious blackness. Jonathan was suddenly in the body of Count de la Fay. Standing at the top of the stairs, in his mind, all of the story flooded into Jonathan's thoughts. The Countess was pregnant. The Count had thought, for nine months, the baby was his. He loved and cherished this unborn child. Until this night, this very night, he found out, in an argument, from the very lips of his own wife, that the baby, his heir, was a bastard. Someone else was the father. His wife, the Countess, had been unfaithful again. Jonathan, as the Count, had her by the shoulders atop the stairs, shaking her in a fit of rage. How could I have been so blind, he cried. No bastard baby will inherit what's mine. No, she cried into his reddened face. 
My love, no! Without another thought, he pushed her, screaming, tumbling down the stairs. The Count watched as her neck was cracked on the stairs. Jonathan felt the regret of the Count as he grasped his hair and pulled it from its roots as he screamed at the top of the stairs. The Count ran down the stairs, stumbling. He hit the hard floor on his knees. Panicked and full of despair, he knelt and watched as the body of his wife, his dead love, birthed a baby that was also dead. A little girl. She lay quiet and still. She did not breathe or cry. She lay limp on the cold hardwood floor. In his tears and pain, the Count went to her and picked up her tiny body from between his wife's legs. He embraced the infant with love and so much grief. He held her close to his chest with so much love and called her by the name his wife wanted to call her. Abigail, he said through rivers of tears. Abigail, you must rest in shame. He sat on the floor near his dead wife, holding his dead daughter in a black house. And he cried. In Jonathan's mind, the scene switched to the Count standing in front of a large stack of logs, where he placed his wife's body. With quiet sadness, the Count threw the torch atop the stack onto his wife's body. The stack burst into flames, and the Countess slowly became a pile of ashes. In Jonathan's mind, days went by, and the Count sat and obsessed with what he would do with the child's rotting body. Finally, he decided to mummify her remains. He wanted future generations to find Abigail just as she was then, a ghost of what would have been the legacy of Count de la Fay. Again, the time jumped forward in Jonathan's mind. The seven horsemen showed up to the mansion and forced their way into the crypt. They performed the ghastly ritual on Abigail that left her pinned like a defenseless butterfly to her grave, and they left, warning the Count of what would happen if he reversed what they had done. Violence on the Count, and his beloved mansion. Jonathan awoke in his bed in the morning. His wife Miriam was already downstairs. She had gone outside to the chickens, milked one of the cows, and found some fresh potatoes, all for their breakfast. When her husband came into the kitchen, she was surprised when he wrapped his arms around her from behind. She smiled and laughed. Miriam turned around to face her husband and kiss him, but he stopped her. I love you, he said. I would never hurt you. Miriam looked a bit shocked. I know, she said. I've known that all along, my love. She smiled, and Jonathan kissed her gently. Miriam finished making breakfast, and they ate in silence. The servants still had not come days after their arrival to the mansion. Jonathan wondered if what the coachman said was true. Maybe this house was cursed, and no one else would dare come near but he and his loving wife. But they had plenty of food and plenty of work to keep them busy. Jonathan was of noble blood, but he was not afraid of hard work. Neither was Miriam. But if the dreams had truth to them, Miriam was with child. However, Jonathan had to push these thoughts away to even get through the day. As night fell, the couple was waiting for their dinner to be finished. They were sitting in the den. Miriam was knitting, and Jonathan went upstairs to get a book from his library. When he came back downstairs, a smell, foul and rancid, filled his nose. It was coming from the dining room. He followed the awful smell against all of his instincts, and found that the dining room was already set for dinner, for three. Jonathan went into the den and asked Miriam if she set the table, and what was that god-awful stench? Miriam denied knowing anything about either. She followed Jonathan into the dining room, where there was indeed three place settings. The smell had diminished by then, and the scent of a home-cooked meal again filled the dining room. I, I may have done it by accident, said Miriam. She shrugged. I don't know. Maybe. My mistake. And she hurriedly picked up the third place setting. The incident was forgotten, and the couple moved on with their evening. Later, as they readied for bed, Miriam was in the bedroom, and heard Jonathan calling for her from one of the other rooms. 
Miriam, come here and see what I've found. He called out to her. As she ran, the stench hit her nostrils and got stronger as she closed in on the room in which Jonathan stood. It was completely dark, save for the moonlight. Jonathan stood and pointed, saying, It's moving! An empty cradle swaying in the air! And indeed, an empty bassinet was rocking softly by itself in the moonlight. I did not bring it in here, he exclaimed. Jonathan looked at Miriam. Now, did you? She violently shook her head and said, No, no, no! Miriam began to cry at the sight of the cradle. Jonathan took her in his arms and walked her back to their bedroom. Jonathan forgot sometimes that Miriam was only eighteen still and had not yet experienced much life yet. But she was a good wife, so he would be a good husband and hold her into the night. On the very next morning, when the mist was eaten away by the sun, Jonathan awoke in their bed next to his wife. He reached over her belly to squeeze her tight and felt that her belly was bigger. He opened his eyes and pulled back the covers to see that her abdomen was noticeably larger. He looked at her sleeping face and moved away from her. Miriam stirred and pulled the covers back over her as she adjusted in the bed. She was smiling softly in her sleep. Horrified, Jonathan had the same line repeating in his mind as he realized the ghost was right. So this was nine. His beloved had a dead child growing in her belly. Miriam's pregnancy would not last the night. Throughout the rest of the day, he knew this would be her last day alive. His lovely Miriam, so young and fair. She began singing to her child a lullaby, rocking the cradle again. She even told Jonathan, I'm having your baby, my love. As the day wore on, Miriam began speaking in foreign tongues, walking strangely, and caressing her ever-increasing belly. But Jonathan knew she was being eaten alive from inside. And finally, as night fell, and the sun died once again behind the hills, Abigail, wearing the body of his wife Miriam, stood before him. Her eyes flashed with eerie evil, her hands held as if they were claws at her sides. She looked at him with a grin, an intent that was threatening. Jonathan found her standing at the door of the new nursery, waiting for him. Jonathan gathered his courage and said, Abigail, I know you're in control of her brain, Abigail. Abigail nodded Miriam's head. Miriam's skin was more pale than ever. She looked as though she were an animated corpse. Her belly was distended and full. And I know that you're the one that's speaking through her, Abigail. He took a few breaths before going on. Miriam, he pleaded, can you hear me? In a croak, only one voice answered him, not remotely sounding like Miriam's sing-song voice. I am alive. Inside your wife. Miriam's dead. I am her head. Jonathan dropped his head in his hands as he wept. Shaking his head, he said to her, Abigail, don't you think I know what you've done? I'll, I'll get a priest. He will know how to get her soul back. A furious wind stirred just then as Jonathan watched the drapes and dust swirl around them in the room. Suddenly, the body of Miriam began to speak again. Oh, Jonathan, it said. This is Miriam. Her voice sounded far away, but it was coming from the frame of his wife. Our time is out, she said in a low voice. Remember the stairs, she shouted. It's the only way. Jonathan moaned loudly and dropped his face into his hands again. As he cried, he said softly between sobs, Nothing I can do but give in. Jonathan he heard Miriam say softly. He looked up and blinked away tears. Miriam, as she had been, was standing before him. She smiled softly and stepped toward him. She softly put her arms around him. I agree, she said, nodding. Yes, I do. 
She softly kissed his lips and stepped back, releasing him again. Jonathan started to step toward her when her head dropped in an unnatural pose. Lightning crashed outside and lit the dark room. Miriam's head snapped up to look at Jonathan. In an evil voice, she said, I am alive. Abigail smiled. Inside your wife. Abigail stepped forward slowly. Jonathan stepped back. Miriam's dead. Jonathan jumped at the sudden loud yelp. I am her head. Abigail continued to step forward, pushing Jonathan back. Soon, I'll be... Abigail lifted her arms to the ceiling and yelled, Free! Abigail continued to move forward, seeming to float, pushing Jonathan back out of the nursery and into the hall. He had his arms up, trying to keep her away. He led her to the stairs and paused. She stood there, looking like a ghost, floating in place. He turned his head to look down the stairs. Something caught his attention. A star shone bright outside the window in the night sky. A sudden blow to the back of his head, and Jonathan was flying down the stairs. He landed finally at the bottom, unable to move his legs, but he was alive. Jonathan fell into unconsciousness. Abigail lifted her arms in the dark. Now we are finally alone, Miriam, she said. Abigail is here to stay. A birth pain rocked through Miriam's body, causing it to double over. Miriam was herself again. The pain of childbirth was not spared her soul. At the top of the stairs, Miriam fell to the floor and began to push. Somewhere, out in the darkness, seven men in shrouds and seven horses running toward the large house, riding from beyond. Miriam screamed in pain as she pushed and blood poured from her. She could almost hear her hoofbeats now. Or was that her heartbeat slowing? She was thinking about the day she and Jonathan arrived in the rain. As she pushed in desperation, she cried out for Jonathan. But she only heard her weeping. Her sight was fading as she lay on the hardwood staring at the ceiling. The pains were fading and something had happened. She wasn't sure what, but as her sight slowly faded to black, she saw tiny yellow eyes looking into her dying face. Miriam heard as she could no longer move, little wet legs moving across the floor. Seven men in black on black horses arrived at the mansion that was dark and silent, as if no one had lived there since they served the Count de la Fay. They searched the entire house, finding the broken bodies of Jonathan and Miriam near the stairs. But the child, Abigail, she was in the crypt. When the men arrived to the family vault, the horror that was found. A baby girl happily eating the mummified corpse of her former self. In unison, the men said, Take her and bring her to the chapel in the forest. Go now. The ceremony and the coffins waiting. And in the dark, and in the wet crypt, they move forward to gather the child. And that's the end of another lullaby. Time has come for me to say good night. Thanks for joining me again, everyone. Please remember to subscribe. Activate the bell icon for future upload alerts, and click the like button if you so desire. If you would like to follow me on Twitter and Facebook, the links are in the description in the deep dark below. You can also come watch as I conquer the underworld one live stream at a time on Twitch. That link is also in the description. Be extra careful this dark season, else there's no presents for Christmas. Y'all take care now, and I'll see y'all real soon. <laughs>